no problem. I'm also recording it now as well. So. We'll give it just another minute and then we can get going. <clears throat> yes, tabs to your question. All righty. Well, welcome everyone. And first off, thanks for everyone. Thanks everyone joining us tonight at 9 p.m. on a Monday uh, for yet another orthodontal webinar uh, hosted by Columbia Orthopedics. Thanks to Miguel, who's our uh, kind of our technical person, and to all our faculty panelists that we have tonight. I'm honored to be amongst uh, some really amazing individuals, including Dr. Uh, Dr. Bill Levine, uh, professor and chair at Columbia. Uh, Dr. Uh, Harrington, Professor and Program Director at Baylor, Dr. Trent Guthrie at Henry Ford, uh, Program Director there, uh, Dr. Monica Kogan at Rush University, who's Program Director there, and soon to be joining uh, my partner here at Hopkins, uh, Dr. Don Laporte, who's finishing up another webinar, will be with us in just a minute. Now, I think that we can all safely say that, you know, the match cycle continues to become increasingly challenging, and there was certainly the introduction of some novel novel things this particular cycle was signaling and it's really great to have dr guthrie to be able to share some additional light um, as the individual helped to spearhead the implementation of it you know what i'd like to just have us jump in and do right off the bat is kind of talk about the match rates as a whole and just get a feel from everybody uh we'll start with dr harrington um how did your program do and you know what kinds of things do you feel uh maybe influenced how people matched or you know or why they did not match in particular well, I think um, you know our program. We we filled. I think every program in the country filled, um, and uh, you know I'm very pleased with our income incoming class. I think uh, look forward to working with them all. I think you know the challenges for those who didn't match. I think are probably similar to previous years, where I think a lot of it has become just the numbers game. And um, I remember you know. Many years ago in the past, you could always find some pretty obvious weaknesses within someone's applications, whether it was board scores, grades, four letters, or some reason that was a red flag on their application if you reviewed those who didn't match. And these days in recent years, it's been, I have <laughs> little idea or no clue of why one person would match versus another because so many good people are slipping through the cracks. And I think it's just the numbers game that we are almost, you know, double the number of applicants as we have spots. That's a great, that's a great point. And it's leading to the sort of changing or varying match rates or unmatch rates in particular. You know, what kinds of things, Dr. Kogan, um, what kinds of things do you think led to why students at your, at your institution, if they did not match, what influenced so that? Um, we your had, um, we did have a student who didn't match and um, there were other students who matched at really good programs and um, whose applications may not have been as stellar, for example, as what you know you expect 
them to be. But I think that what helped those students match at those institutions were their away rotations. Um, they, at every place where they did their away rotations at, I got feedback from the program directors there saying they did an amazing job. And so, you know, whether they got a high pass versus an honors, people will put, kind of put that to the side, um, it, you know, as long as someone comes in and works hard. And I think that that can really set an applicant apart. That's a, you know, it's a really interesting point because obviously away rotations are sort of, you know, we went from just a couple of years ago not having away rotations to now. And as we were talking um, before we came online, students doing more than three, you know, more than three away rotations, which has sort of become an increasing norm. Uh, Dr. Guthrie, you know, how should students be coordinating this with one another, especially with the numbers that are growing at any given institution? What do you advise your students over at Henry Ford? Uh, with regards to managing this uh, facet specifically? Um, yeah, we have a lot of students uh, that, that are actually associated with us because we have both Wayne State and now we have um, uh, Michigan State uh, students um, considering us a bit of a home program. Um, and uh, the numbers uh, from year to year, I mean, we may have 15 or 20 from Wayne State and uh, uh, Michigan State is not as large, but that's a lot of people all competing for the same spots. And uh, I, I think they have taken it over time to uh, coordinate with themselves a little bit to make sure that they're not rotating at the same places. Um, I, I think also uh, we may get into some conversation later about signaling and, and uh, should students be working on um, uh, coordinating where they send signals. Uh, as a program director, if I get multiple applications from one school, I think you can uh, pretty quickly sort through uh, some of those um, and look at the most competitive applicants. And, um, you know, if every single uh, set of five or six applicants from one school is applying to the same program, the top applicant or two or three are gonna get the majority of the interviews and those uh, ones at the four, five, and six and beyond spots, those may be fantastic applicants, but they're probably not gonna get looked at very much because they um, uh, historically would not get looked at uh, very well um, but because they, they're not at that very top of the list. I think that uh, one of our uh, hopes from signaling was that that uh, that could bring other people to uh, to the forefront. That's a really interesting point and kind of mentioned, and I saw Dr. Koga and Dr. Levine both kind of nodded their heads at this notion of coordination. You know, and I'll kind of ask the group and I'll ask Dr. Levine first, how, you know, we've talked about sort of, and you've talked about over the years in our various conversations about sort of, you know, hey, maybe trying to coordinate the top sort of third uh, of your students to apply to X number and maybe the lower third apply to X number to minimize the overlap. Is this something that we should be sort of in uh, encouraging amongst the signals as well in terms of the diversity of programs or salad programs that they're signaling to minimize that overlap. Yeah, um, thanks, uh, Tabs. I think that what's critical for students to do is to take some, hopefully some really good, like solid take home points. And the first one just came from Dr. Guthrie. And that is that we talk about this all the time. If 10 students from your same school apply to the same away sub by and seven of you get accepted, let's just say for the sake of argument, do the math. What's the likelihood that the highest, what's the highest number of students from that program that will get accepted and match there? The, the highest number would be three if you were at a place like NYU with 14 or Mayo with 12 or Harvard with 12. But in all reality, the highest number would probably be two. And in many cases, it might only be one. So the, the truth of this is that I've seen more collaboration among students than in the last two years post-COVID than we've ever seen before. Excel sheets, Google Docs, whatever people are using to try to do that and decide ahead of time. Now, the problem with signaling is that if nobody's coordinating the signaling part of it, then that's completely defeated this whole discussion. Because if all 10 of you apply to the same 30 signaled programs. Now you're killing yourself again. And Trent will give us some data uh, in learning about the first year of signaling, but that's really critical for us to understand that if we don't get the students to buy into this concept that 
they can't all do the same 30 signals because adding 60 non-signal programs is gonna be a colossal waste of money and time and energy. And at the end of the day, probably not change your likelihood of matching. So be smart with your 30 signals, understand as best you can in your own microculture where you stand, if you can. And I get it, a lot of students can't figure that out because the programs won't tell them. That is a, that's really uh, that, challenging. those are some wonderful points. And Dr. Hogan, I'll kind of ask you along the same lines, you know, obviously we'll get into signaling in a bit, but kind of speak to us about the value proposition of advocacy, right? Whether it's at a student level, by faculty that know the student, i.e. letter writers, even by program directors, or just as, you know, or by chairs, is to whose who's sort of advocacy is the most valuable to you as a program director? Um, and does the student sort of hold the cars, hold more power than he or she realizes uh, in terms of their ability to do so for themselves, especially in such a competitive landscape? So, you know, I think the biggest advocate for the students are the students themselves. I think it is um, really important for the students to advocate for themselves when they were on an away rotation, to meet with the program director, to um, get as much information from the residents that they're working with, um, and to reach out to other program directors at institutions that they're interested in. Um, you know, getting, uh, having people reach out on applicants' behalfs is always great. It's always very helpful. Um, you know, I don't know how much weight it has per se, but it is helpful. So I think as many people as a student can have advocate for them is helpful. It does put the students who are from institutions without home programs at a disadvantage. And so it's those students especially that should be advocating for themselves and getting those mentors and reaching out to people. And when they're on away rotations, putting themselves out there and um, you know, just really advocating for themselves. And I just wanna add one more thing on what Dr. Levine said in so far as working together. I think that the students really need to realize that the biggest advocates that they have are their own program directors. And we as program directors want the students to match and we want them to match at programs where it is gonna be best for them. And so as a program director, if we are telling students, listen, your application is okay, these are the programs that you should really be looking at. And these are the programs that you have a really good chance at for them to take that to heart and to listen to the people who actually have some more insight than other medical students. That's all I'm gonna say on that. You're on mute. <laughs> That's a, let's try and do as seamlessly as possible. <laughs> Three years later, right? <laughs> You know, that's a great point, Dr. Kogan. And I'll, I'll ask this to you, Dr. Harrington. You know, the question I get proverbially is, I don't, I'm a student at Baylor and I'm interested in Rush. And I've interviewed, I rotate there, I've interviewed there. I've had a great conversation with Dr. Kogan. But I don't want you to get the wrong idea about my interest in Baylor as a program. How do you kind of navigate that conversation kind of along the lines of what Dr. Kogan was uh, just discussing and kind of encourage that dialogue, which is important because at the end of the day, you know, I think we all can agree that we want to see our students succeed through this process. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually pretty blunt. I tell the students when I ask them, I say, where do you want to go? And I say, don't tell me Baylor because I know we're on your list somewhere and I want to help you look look elsewhere uh, because you can't put all your eggs in one basket. And so, you know, I I do tell them, you know, don't don't tell me how much you want to stay here. I I know that. So where else do you want to look at? And uh, the other thing, um, you know, I do try to remind the students that, you know, just because I'm a joint surgeon and I'm in Texas, I do happen to know you know, a foot and ankle surgeon in Baltimore and a shoulder surgeon in uh, Columbia and a trauma surgeon in uh, Detroit. And so, you know, to let everyone around you know where you're interested in, because we do all know, know lots of different people around. Um, again, it's, I think it's unfortunately one of the unintended consequences of everything moving to pass fail is that who you know is becoming unfortunately more important. And I think we're going few steps backwards towards the uh, the the good old boys club of who's making your calls and sending emails, which does disadvantage uh, students without home programs. Hey, Tabs. 
Yes. Can, can you just address this since we've got about seven questions in a row about yeah. some students from orphan programs uh, and what should they do and how should, who should they get to advocate for them and what are their, what, what's some uh, good pearls for uh, students from orphan programs? You know, I'm actually going to direct that question to Dr. Guthrie to start, and then I'll chime in thereafter. Um, well, I think right now you can look over in the chat and find uh, four emails of people who uh, would uh, listen to you for a few minutes and, and could uh, be an advocate for you. Um, I, I think that uh, it, that is a struggle. Uh, we have several orphan programs in uh, our orphan med schools uh, within uh, our state nearby. Uh, Central Michigan is a big one. Uh, we actually have uh, one of our students uh, from Central um, matched with us a couple of years ago and was doing a great job. So, I mean, I, I think it's a matter of uh, making the connection and then uh, getting the away rotation and leveraging that to your advantage. Um, I, I think another point I'd like to add about advocacy, timing matters. Uh, to me, I can't tell you how many emails I get from people uh, the day after Universal Offer Day. Um, once we send out our interview offers, we're pretty much full. Almost everybody accepts the interviews, and we just don't have a lot of leeway to add extra people. So if you send me an email the week before Universal Offer Day, I might be able to take an extra look at an application that might actually make a difference. Uh, so if you're talking to your mentors, um, and having them advocate on your behalf, uh, make sure that it gets done in an appropriate time when it can actually be meaningful. I think those are some wonderful points. I'll just piggyback off, off of that a little bit uh, to answer the question from Lee's, my perspective. The, you cannot start building out your network too early. And I think we are not sort of encouraged in medical school uh, very proactively to do that. And for the very reason of how, you know, I, I reached out, a lot of people ask me, oh, I know Dr. Levine for X amount of time. I must've been his resident once upon a time. It's actually not the case. I had just sent a cold email and that's how, you know, we got connected and it's erupted into a lot of different things, including, you know, you know friendships and relationships with people on the screen. The, the point I'm getting at is you never know who's going to, you gotta leave no stone unturned. And you have at least four or five people here, myself included, to whom you can reach out. Maybe you'll get a response, maybe you won't, but I would venture to say that people who are on the screen or like the people on the screen, and there's many of them, are accessible if you reach out. They've got to take that first step. And I think the notion of, hey, like stuff's going to be handed out to you is really important to recognize that all these folks are busy orthopedic surgeons. There's a lot going on. And while sometimes some people may proactively reach out to you, it's going to be really well received when you proactively reach out to them. And whether that's your first year thinking about it, even for a second, or your third year starting to make a late decision like I was when I was in that position. And I think that that's important to start really kind of fine tuning, A, who can who can give you advice that is relevant to you? And then who can actually give you guidance? And theoretically, who can serve as a mentor moving forward? All of which are very important to success in the match cycle, whether it's orthopedics or anything else for that matter. But it starts by reaching out. Um, that's the first pearl of wisdom I would offer. On that uh, humble note, uh, we will go ahead and kind of, I wanna just ask everybody um, as we kind of finish out this, this session in particular, which is, which is how, you know, I'll start with Dr. Levine. Um, and even if it's related to Columbia students or otherwise, what's perhaps the number one lesson you've observed in this particular cycle with regards to students and the unmatched student? And we'll go from Dr. Levine to Dr. Guthrie, Dr. Kogan and Dr. Arrington. Uh, I think you have to just recognize that that um, it, it's it's a numbers problem uh, first and foremost, and and that's hard to hear. Uh, but there are incredibly qualified students that are probably not going to match simply because of falling through the cracks, simply because of maybe not getting a good enough uh, self. Um, check of how competitive they are, or they are competitive, but they do all their ways at the most competitive programs and just fall right. You know, I, I tell students this all the time. Think about this. We interviewed 47 students last year, Tabs, at Columbia from our 900 applications or whatever the number was. 
And so if you got ranked 25th out of the 47, that's like, that means you're one of the top 25 students, at least as we measured the students. And to be honest, those 47 are on most everyone else's list, give or take, at the other top programs around the country. So you're like one of the top 25 students, except we matched it on a number that's higher than that. And maybe you got ranked 20 to 25 on 15 programs and you all of a sudden fall through the cracks. So I just was typing a, a response. Yes, you have to have a plan B, no matter how good you are, no matter how strong you are, you definitely need a plan B. And whether that's a research year or whether that's a prelim, prelim gen surge year, to me depends on what your portfolio looks like. If you're light on research, plan a research year, especially at a school like Columbia where you can defer graduation and not have to reapply as a unmatched applicant. I think that's a, a distinct advantage. Wonderful, Dr. Guthrie. <laughs> um, well, I, I would uh, uh, agree absolutely with the, the numbers issue. You know, when we look at uh, 1700 uh, and change applications on the ARIS and actually on the NRMP end, it always ends up about 1400, which is uh, something that I think needs to be looked at. Where are these 300 people going every year? Um, uh, they're probably not even getting interviews um, and, and looking to other specialties. Um, and then, um, you know, we have 800 uh, uh, and change spots. And uh, so the numbers, um, yes, U.S. grads, uh, the match rate's 80 plus percent, but overall it's, it's a 50-50 proposition if you look. Um, and uh, I, I would absolutely agree with Dr. Levine. I think you need to uh, have strategy. I think to me, that's the thing that has changed uh, this year with signaling and, and getting back to away rotations is strategy becomes important. Before the strategy was shotgun. I'm going to apply to everything, uh, every single program out there, and I'm going to see what sticks. Um, but that I think doesn't work anymore with, with signaling. You need to be strategic about where you're sending your signals. You need to be strategic about where you're doing your away rotations. And I think if you do, I think the people that should be matching will match and they'll match at places that they want to match. Um, so uh, to me, I, I think strategy is my one sort of, uh, uh, lesson learned this year. It's becoming much more important. Awesome. Patrick Hogan. I mean, I think that um, they kind of have touched on all the points. I, I agree with what Dr. Levine and Dr. Guthrie said in regards to being smart, being honest with yourself, having a good strategy, and definitely having a plan B and being okay with that plan B. I got Dr. Harrington? Yeah, I would say I would just reemphasize uh, the, the previous uh, statements from Dr. Levine and Dr. Guthrie about uh, teamwork and working as a team with all of the applicants in your class. If you've got more than five people in your class uh, applying, then you need to collaborate and work together so that you don't box each other out. It's critical. Pabs, can I, I just want to just amplify that a, a, a bit because I hear students say, well, you know, uh, it, I don't care about the other students because it's, I just care about me matching. And the only thing I say to that student is at least when you're talking about away rotations, the argument is that you're actually going to hurt yourself. So if you can just work in that sandbox on the away rotations, that's a start. I think it's a lot to ask of students to have to coordinate the 30 signals on their own. I don't think that's reasonable. I don't think it's realistic. And that's why lack of mentorship or supervision is problematic. So the 10 Columbia students, some of whom are on here tonight, know that they've already submitted their list of 30 wish list um, signals to me. And that way I can look at them. I know where they all are preferentially ranked. And so I'm helping making sure that not all 10 of them are going to the same 30 programs. Uh, and, and if you don't have that ability, you gotta figure out some way to figure out amongst yourselves and with your program director or with some mentors, how to div divide and conquer because you can't all do the same 30 or you're going to kill each other. And I'm just going to have oh, one more thing ahead. after that. Um, again, the program directors are on your side. And so it doesn't hurt you as a student to tell the program directors, hey, listen, 
I want to go to Utah, or I want to go to Baylor, or I want to go, we are your advocates. And so many years, you know, students wouldn't tell any of us where they wanted to go because they were worried that it was going to affect where they were going to be ranked at Rush. And so we are there as program directors to help the students get where they want to be. And, you know, just be honest, and we are here to help you guys. Those are all wonderful points and all wonderful points. And oh, welcome Dr. Laporte. Um, and I think it's a great transition to start thinking about the signaling element. And, you know, I do want to um, kind of hand the, the mic over to Dr. Guthrie uh, just for a couple of minutes to kind of speak to some of the, a sort of what the, a little bit of what the signaling was for um, and sort of was the number sort of correct and what was selected for ortho anyway. And what, what was found from the most recent data that's at least come from the uh, Council for the Residency Directors? Um, well, I think uh, as a little bit of a segue as we dive into some of the data, um, I, I would like to just add on to this conversation about uh, communicating and working together on your, your signal portfolio. Uh, half of the applicants that we uh, surveyed uh, said that they did communicate with their classmates when uh, deciding where to signal. So I, I don't think this should be a taboo by any means. Uh, if in the first cycle, uh, students had already figured out that they should be doing this, uh, half of them uh, did uh, report doing that. So I, I think that that uh, is a behavior that we can certainly normalize going forward. Um, so signaling kind of 30,000 foot view, I, I, when we look at that, um, um, our uh, original uh, goal was to try and add value to the application process to both the um, applicants and to the programs. And when we looked at uh, the status quo, applicants were applying to on average 80 plus programs. Uh, programs were getting uh, on the order of uh, 800 to 1000 or more applications. And uh, it was really um, an untenable situation from both sides. It was uh, too much for programs to manage uh, the application review process. And it was uh, too much for the applicants to be uh, sending in all of their application fees. In the, the 2021 cycle, so the cycle before this, before signaling, uh, applicants spent uh, almost three and a half million dollars just on application fees alone. And uh, we didn't really feel like that was appropriate moving forward. So we wanted to add value and, and one of the things that had come up was uh, the the uh, concept of preference signaling. So this grew out of uh, actually uh, economics grad programs uh, years ago and had worked its way into medicine uh, in uh, two cycles before we started. One was uh, in uh, ENT who did that on their own uh, for two cycles with five signals. And then uh, the AAMC through uh, the ARIS supplemental application added uh, preference signaling in uh, three specialties uh, the year before. Uh, they had good results um, with uh, a few exceptions. Um, when we looked at um, programs that had used uh, five or fewer signals, one thing that we saw in those uh, first two cycles uh, was something that I call a signal concentration. So what we, what applicants would do is they would send most of their signals to their sort of aspirational programs. And uh, the uh, top 25% of programs in those uh, first cycles uh, saw 50% of the signals. And then there was a very sharp drop off. So it creates this sort of feast or famine where the top programs have nothing but signals and that doesn't really help them. And then everybody else has no signals and that doesn't really help them either. Uh, but we wanted to create a situation where uh, it actually uh, would be useful. And we looked at uh, using more signals and obviously we were a bit of an outlier in that uh, time last year, we decided to go with 30 um, uh, for a number of different reasons. We don't have to get into the details of that now, but um, in looking at how it worked, uh, it was quite popular. Uh, the applicants and uh, programs uh, uh, thought that that was an appropriate number. Uh, the vast majority uh, thought we should continue uh, at that number. Um, and in fact, as I've gone around presenting data to other specialties, we've had a number of other specialties jump ship, and now they are going with a high signal number as well. Uh, ENT is going with uh, 25, I believe. Neurosurgery is going with 25. Uh, there are at least, uh, anesthesia is going up uh, uh, over 20. So multiple specialties now, after having seen uh, one iteration of this, have already said, you know what, that's much better than doing five. 
um, because that doesn't accomplish what we wanted to accomplish. Um, the uh, uh, the one take home, if I have one take home from the data that we have, it's uh, the uh, interview invitation rate. Uh, so if you look historically uh, at interviews, if you think of your one application as a signal to programs historically, that would grant you about a 5% chance of an interview. So every application you sent, about a 5% chance. This year with signaling, uh, to programs that you signaled, you had a 23% chance of getting an interview. So almost a four or five fold uh, increased rate of getting an interview. Now, the flip side of that, the same number of interviews are out there. So if you did not signal a program, uh, the number drops to less than 1%. Um, and so we'll talk about some things later. Um, should you apply to more than the 30 programs? Uh, what are my chances of getting an interview if I don't signal? And, you know, all those sorts of things. And uh, I can't tell you as an individual applicant how you should apply, how many programs you should apply to and all of that. But I can show you the data and show you chances are much better than uh, we had historically of getting an interview to your signal programs. But your chances are next to zero to get an interview at a program that you do not signal. I hope that's a mic drop moment. For, for everybody. <laughs> I just I heard tabs, tabs. I just heard two things. I just heard Trent say that everybody else is following orthopedics. What else is new? So great job, Cord. Uh, and I also heard loudly and clearly. And this is why this whole issue of of coordinating signaling becomes so critical because mass applying to a hundred programs is going to be a massive waste of your money. Uh, and we'd much rather that you pick 30 good places that you have a reasonable chance. Just remember, uh, Trent, can you just address it? I've put it in the in the Q and A about three times already, but from from your mouth as cord member and uh, and author, uh, just make sure you we tell everybody the whole issue about should you signal your away rotations? Should you signal your home program? What is the cord uh, mantra on that? Yeah. So this is. Uh... Interesting. Uh, I will start by saying, yes, you should signal all programs that you are interested in, uh, including home and away. That was our guidance last year. Um, that was uh, on the CORD website. That was in multiple webinars. That was in multiple emails. That was uh, on the AAMC supplemental application guide. And one of the interesting uh, points from our survey was that 40% of programs told applicants not to signal home or away <laughs> programs in some way. Um, and thankfully, uh, when we asked the same question to the applicants, it was like 92% uh, didn't listen to that guidance and uh, <laughs> followed the instructions and applied to uh, or signaled home and away programs. So going forward, AAMC uh, has decided to have a universal uh, um, recommendation that you should signal all programs home and away and everything that you're interested in. Uh, we wanted to do this to help provide equity because not everybody can go to the same number of uh, away rotations. And so in a sense, those people were getting free signals and we didn't want that to, to harm anyone. And that was one of the reasons we went with a higher signal number to allow for however many home and away programs you have under that umbrella. Um, another thought was, what if you go to an away rotation and you really hate it? Or should you waste a signal on that? I think no. That the whole point is your signals are precious. Uh, they uh, confer a 23% chance of an interview if you uh, believe the data. And so you shouldn't waste those uh, on any program. Um, you know, uh, again, signal all programs you're interested in, home and away. I, I, you know, I want to. This is it's super valuable data, and it's really kind of cool to see how it's sort of just taken shape and just and been influential in just a year. Um, I'd like to just kind of get a take a quick poll from everybody. Did everyone see numbers go down compared to 21 22 in terms of applications? Uh, I'll start with you, Dr. Harrington. Uh, yes, our overall numbers were down a little bit. Um, I think last year we had uh, 1,100 total applications. This year it was, I think, around okay. 807. Uh, Dr. LaPorte, welcome, by the way. Thank you. Sorry to be late. Uh, our numbers went down as well. And I know the overall NRMP uh, numbers went down by over 100. I 
Um, great to hear. Dr. Kogan, what about a rush? You're on mute. Three years in. Um, our overall numbers went down for sure. And then Dr. Levine, did the numbers go up? Numbers went down as expected. The numbers did exactly what they were supposed to do. People had to make decisions about their signals. Yeah. And, uh, and Dr. Gregory, what happened at Henry Ford? Same thing? Same thing. Um, and so to uh, take that forward, yes, uh, programs on average saw a 17% decrease in applications uh, this year. Um, when we look, there were a few uh, uh, fewer applicants. Uh, so some of that is, is that effect, but um, applicants uh, applied to 12 and a half fewer uh, programs than they had previously. So the number was down from like 87 to 78, I believe this year um, as an average uh, application number. Uh, we had a question on the CORD survey to applicants about that as well. And we asked how many programs would you have applied to were you not able to use signaling this year? And that number was exactly 12.5%, uh, which is the number that we saw they applied to uh, fewer. So um, my hope is uh, that, again, we can continue to uh, give some relief to our uh, overburdened applicants and they can apply to fewer programs going forward. That, that is it's awesome data to hear. Uh, you know, I think it really brings up the next question, which I think everyone would be good to hear from everyone's perspective, which is, we're, you know, you still have, you have many programs that have, you know, even Henry Ford um, or associated med schools with a double digit number of students applying. Uh, Columbia, I think you mentioned, uh, Dr. Levine, you have 10, we've got five, you know, so obviously it's kind of varied. But there is still the anxiety of not matching, knowing what the rates have been over the last couple of years in particular. So what, what do we, what's, what is everyone's thought on should you apply to more than 30 or should you not? And is what sort of the guidance moving forward? Because I think that's what on, what's on everyone's mind. Is, is it worth applying to more just because, because I can. Okay, I'll feel a little better if I do that. Because again, we know that that's the mantra that probably will be spurred on, um, unfortunately. Dr. Kogan, I'll start with you. Um, can you just start with someone else? Because I'm answering a resident's text right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. I'll start with Dr. Laporte. Okay. Well, I think we're heading in the right direction, like everyone has said. And I think we're heading to where we can advise people to just apply to 30 programs or, you know, where they're signaling. Um, but I think in light of the 63%-ish match rate last year, um, it's still hard to tell people not to apply to more. Um, even though we know that you're going to get interviews at less than 2% of the programs you don't signal. So um, I know that's not a real perfect answer. I think we're heading towards telling people 30, but I imagine they'll apply to more than 30 this year. Okay, back to you, Dr. Kogan. I'm ready. So um, the only issue with only applying to 30 that I could see is that there are some programs that didn't use signals. And I think it's important to know which one of those programs which programs didn't use signals and then apply to them. And some programs used signals and then expanded to non-signals. So, and other programs only use signals. So until I think we know who did what, I think, you know, applying. I, I, yeah, and I, Monica, I totally agree with you. And I think the bottom line is that nobody here is gonna, you know, unless you really control it all, you know, for me, I can tell someone don't apply to more than 30 because I know all 10 of the students. I know what their portfolios look like. But for most people, I don't think anybody here is going to, if you want to apply to 120 programs, that is your prerogative. And if you feel that's in your best interest, nobody here is going to hold you back from that. It's important to understand the data. And it's important to hear that Trent and Cord and, and the group are, are gathering this data to try to give you the best information possible. But I don't think it's anybody's right to say, well, don't apply to more. It's just nice to know, or it should be good for you to know as a student, that the likelihood of that being successful is probably not very high. And it's going to probably get worse, not better, 
as we get more information, as everybody starts to, uh, to participate in signaling. Yeah, and I think that that's a, that's a challenge in of itself, right? Because there's that, you know, heterogeneity. Um, and so, you know, Dr. Guthrie, on that note of sort of the programs that were surveyed, was it was it only the programs that participated in the signaling process that were surveyed, or had you surveyed all participating programs in CORD um, or all CORD residency directors specifically, which pretty much includes, yeah, I'm assuming it includes everybody? Uh, the survey was out to all um, uh, CORD programs, um, and we certainly did have some that didn't participate. Um, the when we looked last year, ninety one percent were uh, some of the historically osteopathic programs. Um, there were a very small minority of, uh, I think, like three or four programs that really uh, that did not participate in the supplemental application. Now, um, from the applicant side, this is something that I think will change going forward uh, as the supplemental application is no longer supplemental. It's going to be part of the, the full ERIS application. Um, but the applicants couldn't tell, I think, whether a program was participating or not. So I know that there were some signals sent to programs that weren't participating um, or that so when you sign up, you could say that you participated or not, but then there were some that signed up, but then decided I'm not going to use signals. That was the, the, the issue. Um, and those showed up as participating in signaling, but you didn't know that they weren't going to really use the signals on the back end. Um, I, again, I think that was a small minority of programs, um, but I, going forward, we hope to have that data or that um, information out to applicants on the, the ORIN website uh, through CORD uh, to say whether they're uh, participating in signaling or not. Um, I, I think um, in, with uh, regards to that, that number, um, I, I I don't know. I agree with Dr. Levine. You know, it's your prerogative. If you want to continue to apply to 80, 100, 120 programs, uh, you can certainly do that. I think uh, our job is to show the data and then uh, everyone can make up uh, uh, their own minds about uh, whether uh, they're going to do that, whether they're going to do a apply, whether they're going to have a plan B to um, get into a uh, one of the 500 open uh, emergency medicine spots or uh, just what they'd like to do. Trent, do you have a sense of what percentage of programs are participating in signaling? Is it over 95%? So, nine, yeah, 91% signed up last year. 91%, uh, okay. And I uh, mm -hmm. assume that will be higher this year, but we'll see. Was awesome. there a number that showed of those 91% or 95%, did they also look at students that didn't signal? Are there any, is there any data on that? Um, mm, oh, oh, yes. So that um, is, uh, um, I don't have that data back yet. So we have two different surveys. We had a survey out in the fall uh, to applicants and to programs, uh, kind of dealing with interviews and, and uh, their early thoughts on, on the signaling process. And we have a, a survey that just closed uh, um, and we don't have that data really analyzed yet on uh, post-match. Uh, I hope to have that very soon, and that will be interesting to see, you know, of those who didn't match, how did they play their signals versus those who did match. I mean, there's a lot that we can get into there, but um, unfortunately, I don't have that just yet. We will very soon. Hey, uh, um, Tabs, can we, um, I know there's, we could spend like five hours on signaling. Uh, we're, there's so, please, please no. There's yeah, so many. No, no, other, no. But, no can, we're good. Can we're we good. go to the, to sure. can we pivot to the, um, what do the program directors that are here and you and the group think about what factors are you looking at the most now uh, in the post no AOA, no, um, uh, no standard your clerkship grades. So there's a lot of questions about what are people looking at and how are they deciding who's the the best I will student. I will dovetail that with sort of where I was going to take the questioning and actually throw this to Dr. Harrington to kind of to um, jump in with it is, 
you know, we've got now step one has gone to pass fail, step two is sort of, and now we've got the first batch where it's truly like majority or pass fail um, on the step one side. And we've got now then step two there. Uh, we've got the variety of factors Dr. Levine has mentioned. What in your mind, what sort of is the first thing that jumps out at you when you're staring at an application? What are you kind of looking at to serve as your litmus test for that application? It's a great question. I got to figure that out. <laughs> um, so I think number one is going to be a signal. Um, you know, I, I have a feeling that uh, just because of human nature, um, step two will, uh, similar to step one, take in much overweighted and overvalued uh, importance in the application, um, rightly or wrongly, probably more wrongly than anything. But um, I have a feeling there's going to be a big emphasis on step two. I think the other thing is that I think away rotations are probably going to start playing a bigger and bigger role and I think more people I mean that's always you know had the data had the data to show that you're more likely to match somewhere you rotated but I think it may get even more importance uh, since that's one of the few ways we get to know people because with everything going past fail everybody looks the same on paper um, you know I think one area that may truly become more valuable and actually get read by more people are the personal statements to truly look for things that make people stand out and unique. Those are some really great points. Stop to the floor, I'll kind of throw the same question your way and also kind of ask about, you know, the, the MSPE is really the letter of rec from the medical school. And, you know, how does that now, how does that sort of play a role in your mind when you're going through the apps? Um, and are there any other specific factors that Dr. Harrington mentioned, Dr. Lean or others have mentioned that kind of jump out at you, especially knowing that some of these objective measures um, are going by the wayside? Uh, thanks. Yeah, definitely a good question. I uh, agree with Dr. Harrington that programs that uh, you know, get over 300 signals and still need to do, but I think that away rotation is probably along with signal most important because that's where we're going to get to really know the person as an individual. The Dean's letter or that MSP can give some insight to clerkship performance since there aren't, uh, since many schools don't have grades. So I think there's more attention to that, but it's less consistent. So I would say letters of recommendation are really important um, because they're from um, orthopedic surgeons and people um, like our Hey, Dr. Laporte, you're cutting out for a second. Sorry, did you, um, I was just saying that letters of recommendation are really important. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, and along with the letters would be a component of networking and advocacy. I think knowing, having a connection at programs. So your away rotation is your best foot in the door, but then beyond that, having some connections um, at other programs if you're interested is valuable um, because that lets them know who you are and why you're interested and why you're great. <clears throat> these are these are some great great thoughts and, and great points and you know we kind of talked a little bit about the away rotation piece and kind of this notion of advocacy you know where if, if you don't have if you don't have a home program as was mentioned at the outset and you really don't know where to start what is sort of going to be the best way to say like how do i decide like where i should be doing an away rotation you know um so dr kogan what what is sort of you know your thought your metric as far as how does someone sort of pick that when they may not necessarily have sort of you know support at home to tell them oh you should be applying here going here taking advantage of xyz connections in order to leverage that mentorship such network so, you know, I think in today's day and age with Zoom, it, it makes that advocacy for yourself so much easier. And it's a cold call, it's a cold email to program director that has a reputation of mentorship, of responding to emails and asking them, you know, what's your opinion? What's your, where do you think I should be? This is my history, this is my CV. And just putting yourself out there and asking. And, you know, I tell students, 
you know, send an email. If you don't get a response, just move on to the next person. You know, there's a thousand people out there that are willing to help. And, um, I'm, you know, just reach out to somebody in, in order to get those answers. Because if you do, I, I really think that nowadays um, programs and selection committees are a little bit more um, aware of orphan students and people from orphan programs. And I do think that they give those students a little bit more benefit of the doubt than they did 15, 20 years ago, where, you know, they had nobody to speak for them. They had no research. They, and I think now we're a little bit more aware of the fact that these students have an uphill battle. And so, um, you know, make that uphill battle a little bit less and advocate for yourself and reach out to people to help you out. I think that's a great, that's a great point. And I see Dr. Levine's hand up. Wow, your hand is up. Okay. Just a I'm quick. I've impressed. Go around, <laughs> go, go around the room. Uh, also, Melvin, do you have a, a step two cutoff at Baylor? Uh, no. Uh, Trent. Monica. Yeah, but it's low. Can you say what it is out loud? It's been two thirty-five. I mean, and that was that was high in years past, but now average score is two fifty. So this is the equivalent of like a two eighteen. Okay, Don. Um, we have a soft cutoff, and then I look at all the applications in the ten points below that. Okay, so. we have no we have no cutoff for step two at Columbia. So this notion that there's a step two cutoff, I think, is complete uh, fallacy that's perpetrated around. The, you know, let's make everybody go crazy about step two scores right now. That being said, yes, you guys are all super smart. And you do really well on standardized tests. So, um, and the scoring is like ridiculous. Like two seventies are commonplace now. We never saw two seventies, but but that that is not something that is going to keep you in or out of. Uh, Scott Porter, if he were on this panel, he would say if you got a two seventy, you automatically will not get an interview uh, at in uh, at pr at Prism, right? <laughs> oh, is that the reason why I didn't get an interview there? Yes, that was it. Okay. <laughs> Um, I, I do think it brings up the important point, and I want to highlight this for everybody um, as we're moving through various topics right now. It is not about any one particular thing, right? And I think I could probably safely say, and others would likely agree, it is about the entire application, right? And if you look on the ORIN website that Dr. Guthrie alluded to, which is the Orthopedic Residency Information Network that speaks to you know, a variety of different factors um, from, you know, from or orthopedic programs and their attributes of the residents at the programs, you'll see there's such a distribution of step scores as an example of research or what have you, that it just goes to show you that it's not just about a given step score. It's not just about like, you know, honoring everything. It's not just, a, it's about everything together. And that's why the strategizing, listening to esteemed individuals that are on this panel, amongst others, is really important to start as early as you can, especially if you're deciding on something competitive like orthopedic, so you can uh, garner for yourself and corral the people around you who can best help you leverage your strengths, right, and empower you to move forward. That is perhaps one of the most important things you can take away from this discussion, which I think often goes missed because people get focused on all the paper stuff. And there's more than just the paper stuff. It's the paper stuff. And then as you heard Dr. Laporte and Dr. Kogan say, the away rotation performance, what people think of you, how they speak to you, the strengths of your application. All of these things are so important as you're moving forward. So keep that in mind as you're planning to reach out and ask for advice and so on. Um, as we're kind of wrapping up, you know, in our last in a few minutes here, uh, one of the things I think that's important to kind of, you know, think about is, you know, application numbers. We've been dancing around it a little bit. Um, and even just number of aways, right? You know, so I'll go around the room. How, um, Dr. Levine, how many, how many uh, away rotations do you tell the Columbia students to do? Um, and how many on average applications do you ask them or have you encouraged them to submit? So the, um, yeah, the current, the current tipping point that happened several years ago is three, um, one home rotation and three away rotations. Uh, our school does allow that to happen, but it does make it harder for them and that they have to do some maneuvering uh, with the dean's office to be able to do that. Um, uh, last year was the first year that we had signaling. And so 
the top, we only had five students apply last year. Uh, two students applied to uh, 15 programs only. Uh, those were the top two students. The other three applied to between 40 to 60 because we didn't know what to do with the signals. This year of the 10, we're gonna have uh, the top four are gonna apply to no more than 30. Uh, the next group is gonna probably apply to a few extra. And then the last group will apply to a few extra just until we know more information. Um, but we try to coordinate that pretty closely so that they don't, again, overlap significantly. Dr. Kogan, same question. So we had, um, on average, our students apply to about 60 programs. So they work together. Um, our students um, at Rush, they sat down together. I, I met with them all ahead of time. We talked about um, figuring out where they were going to signal, where they were going to do their aways, and they worked together with um, Dr. Blank to kind of figure out where everyone was going to go. But they they applied to about 60. Dr. Laporte? Uh, I would say our students last cycle applied to about 60 as well, some a few more. Um, we definitely encourage them to talk to each other and strategically uh, send their signals. Dr. Iyer and I met with each of them individually. We uh, suggest that no more than two uh, do in a way at the same uh, institution. Um, and I think that answered all the questions. Dr. Harrington. Yeah, um, this year in terms of uh, away rotations, I think the vast majority of our uh, students are gonna do three or four. Uh, Baylor's a little bit more uh, liberal and open and so they can, they can squeeze in a few extra here and there. So I think most are going to be doing three or four away uh, rotations. Um, and this year we have uh, 15 students applying and they've actually done a phenomenal job. My, uh, I give credit to my partner, Chris Perkins, who runs our med student program. He has done a great job working with them and they've, they've all divvied up sort of geographically and where they're interested in and where they want to go. And so they're all sort of grouped off into different areas that they're planning on coordinating um, their ways as well as their uh, signals. So I'm hoping that it'll be, be successful for all 15 of them. That is, well, that's a lot to all of them. Uh, Dr. Guthrie? Um, well, we uh, um, at Wayne State, uh, the students can do up to six orthopedic rotations, I think, um, because they have a, a affiliation with multiple different programs. So they can do essentially three home rotations in orthopedics and then three away rotations um, at other institutions. Um, I, I think that's uh, way too many. So there's sort of two different questions. One is, what do you tell your students? I, I think you should tell your students to do as many aways as possible, because we know that doing an away rotation gives you the best chance of matching at a certain institution. But we, I think, need to answer the societal question of how many should students be doing? And I think that's different. And I would agree with uh, Dr. Levine on that sort of three number, I think is probably appropriate. That gets you enough uh, notice at different institutions uh, that is not going to break the bank as much as doing uh, four or five or more away rotations, uh, because it does be, become a big financial burden to students. Um, so I, I think uh, hopefully we can um, uh, collectively wrap our heads uh, around that issue and, and get that number down a bit. But, um, you know, I think if, uh, if you're able to do um, a lot of away rotations, that's probably going to help your odds of matching. Yeah, I will add one thing and just say, I think the financial piece is an important one to consider. I also think that it's med mentally and physically very taxing, especially as you go further and further along. And, you know, in the same way, just because you apply to more programs, uh, even prior to signaling, it doesn't mean you get more interviews, uh, certainly now with signaling, but just because you do more ways does not guarantee you interviews at those places too. Uh, I think that that's a, that's probably an increasing trend that I've observed is that there's more and more places that aren't automatically giving students an interview as well, just because they rotate there. So more a ways is not necessarily equate to getting more. Now, of course, 
if you choose to go down that route, the same way if you choose to apply to 120 program, that's one thing. But the further along you are, probably the greater chance you have of maybe not being able to shine, uh, potentially anyway. And that's something you have to sort of weigh against the you know pros and pros and cons of as you're you're navigating this. Um, you know, on that humble note, it's just about um, 10 o'clock, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I really want to give a big shout out to uh, Miguel Morel um, from Columbia Ortho for helping to coordinate this logistically for all the technical support, if you will, and. Um, and of course, to you know, Dr. Levine, Dr. Kogan, Dr. Laporte, Dr. Harrington, Dr. Guthrie, uh, for your time and your, you know, all your Q and As and uh, support supporting this these efforts is always wonderful. Especially your support of students is really unparalleled. So thank you very much, and everyone have a great night. Our contacts are in the chat box uh, right now. You can also head to OrthoMentor on Instagram um, and feel free to uh, send me a message there uh, if you don't, um, if you haven't done so already. Uh, look forward to hearing from all of you and have a great night. And best of luck this cycle. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you.